about 1965 or 70 years ago, the Apostle Paul actually penned these words. So fitting with what we've just heard. And it is from the chapter that I want to speak to you about today. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul writes these words to a brand new church in Corinth, dug out of the middle of a pagan pool of people who were just learning about this resurrected Jesus we just sang about. Paul writes these words. He says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I declared to you the testimony about God. Because I resolved not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul writes, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with eloquence or human wisdom because I wanted it to be in a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And then Paul says in verse 5, My greatest desire is that your faith would never rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. The reality is the greatest thing we need in our churches is we need a demonstration of the power of God that's transforming people's lives. Um, All throughout Christianity in the West, we have a lot of talk. What we really need is Jesus to transform somebody from the inside out so they'll never be the same. And quite frankly, God can do more in about five minutes among us than we can do in five years of organized church activity. So that's what we want to talk about today. I just, I just want to say thank you for the privilege of being here, uh, Denise and, and uh, Andrew and myself, for the privilege of of uh, sharing the word with you today for this great church, for, for um, Pastor Steve and Kaylee and their incredible leadership. This is one of the best couples that we have, not only the uh, Chicago Central District, this, this is one of the best, godliest, most talented couples that we have in the country. And they are, they're serving this great church, and we're so thankful for their leadership, thankful for their hearts, thankful for the way they love uh, the kingdom, and, uh, and so for the way that... Um, that uh, you are linking arms with us. And, and then uh, Carla, as you know, uh, Carla Lovett serves on our leadership team, the district level. You folks have a unique capability. Pastor Steve reminded me of this. You have the neat, unique capability of hearing firsthand what God is doing in 30,000 congregations around the world where he's breaking out, and because of her leadership role, you can pray about it uh, because you hear about it uh, many times before I even hear about it. And so, uh, and then to have Pastor get the chance to, uh, to uh, intersect again with Pastor Herb. Way back in a previous life, uh, Pastor Herb and I connected because he was leading a great church in uh, Sparks, Nevada, and actually was a missional pastor doing an incredible job and launched a new church. Uh, that in, um, in the Sparks area that, uh, that uh, was, uh, I had the privilege of coaching. And so um, this is just a great, this, this is also like a, like a uh, family reconnection time for Denise and I and Andrew to be here today. And for you to be here amidst this wonderful Chicago first, uh, first uh, uh, season of weather. And so it's really... <laughs> It's coming, and uh, you know, Denise and I, we pulled in the parking lot. We thought, you know, I just love the four seasons, you know? Wouldn't it be horrible if we had to live in some place where we didn't get snow, and all you saw was sunshine all the time, and so I love the seasons. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I mean, I love snow. I love rain. I love, uh, I love autumn. I love spring, and, um, and I also love the presence of Jesus when I walk into a place like this. You know, I was, as I was praying this morning here, 
on the way here, uh, the, the Lord brought the Isaiah passage to me, and this was my prayer for, for this morning. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse uh, 4 and 5, um, about 2,750 years ago, a prophet was sitting at some kind of a table and wrote these inspired words. He said, the spirit of the Lord is, um, is, uh, is on me because he has anointed me to preach. And then, um, and then in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4, the, the, the prophet uh, writes, um, The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that will sustain the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ears to listen like one being taught. You know, I, I love the song that we sang this morning, Holy Spirit. Come and fill this place with your atmosphere. And the prophet 2,750 years ago, he, he wrote, um, the sovereign Lord's given me an instructed tongue. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ears to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I've not been rebellious. I've never drawn back. And that is the same Holy Spirit that is in this place. And um, so would you just bow with me as we begin, and let's ask the Holy Spirit that inspired these words so long ago to inspire our hearts today. Father, I'm really grateful for your presence here today. I'm grateful for the fact that the miracle of preaching happens whenever an individual stands, has stood for the last 75 years in this place, representing this great church. Thank you for the visionary founders that started this church, and for these altars, representative of that altar that you told us in uh, Hebrews 13.10, that uh, is a representative of Jesus. So we come to this place today knowing that there have been literally thousands of people that have been touched with the ministry of this church. Thousands of prayers that have been prayed over children and Thousands of sermons that have been delivered and, and just uh, uh, millions of dollars that have been laid sacrificially in offering plates to build this great house of worship and to be the sending resource center so that your gospel could be proclaimed throughout the earth. Just to stand in this place is such a hallowed privilege. So I pray that the same Holy Spirit that has inspired all of the prayers and all of the songs and all of the sermons and all of the Sunday school teachings, and all of, the, all of the children that have been loved. I pray that today that same spirit that has come forth and has changed and continues to change people would be the same spirit today that would come and talk to us. Father, I pray that you'll help us to have ears. You've told us that he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit wants to say to the church. So, Father, have conversations with people today. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to speak today, Father, and I'll use some words. But really, more important than the words I choose are the words that you want to choose to every open heart today. Have the individual conversations that sovereignly only the Holy Spirit can have with individuals. And whatever the Spirit whispers to us today, I pray every person in this place today every person who's watching or would watch by live streaming or by tape, or every person that's here in the sanctuary today, would you help every person to take the next step spiritually that you want them to take? In Jesus' name, we offer our prayers. And all of God's people said, amen. I want to introduce you to uh, the Chicago Central District. Um, I have the privilege of waking up every day and being concerned about uh, 68% of the state of Illinois that all lives within 12 counties in the northeast quadrant. 8.7 million people live in these 12 counties. This actually, we actually had a graphic artist. In fact, Pastor Steve actually helped us shape this logo. You'll notice this logo every time you look at it. We hope you'll be reminded that this is a logo looking at our entire district from the east. So here is Danville right down here, and we've got some rural area here. This, right ha this happens to be the bell tower of uh, Olivet Nazarene University. This is a $25 million chapel that's all paid for that sits on the campus. And then about right here, we start with the greater Chicago suburbs that represents where you folk are on the west. 
from right here south, there are 200,000 people, 250,000 people who live. A lot of our resources as a district are, are centered in that central mission area, uh, but that's where 250,000 people live. Right here and going north all the way to the Wisconsin border, 8.5 million people reside. 8.5 million people. So these are our seven mission areas. There's 8.7 million people on our district. 3.6 million or more. Uh, there's a lot of people that do go to that there are on a church roll, but 3.6 million people on our district are not on a church roll. Catholic, Baptist, um, Greek Orthodox, you name it. They're not on any church connection whatsoever. And um, you folk happen to be residing in the most populated geographic region we have. There are 3.5-plus uh, million people who live in the north-northwest mission area. This mission area is a fascinating collage of people that are coming from all over the world. There are 5.7 million people in this uh, constellation, this beautiful group that God has put together and sent to our area that we have the privilege of, of, um, of introducing Jesus to. 5.7 million self-identify as speaking English. There are 1.5 million, about 1.5, that self-identify as speaking Spanish. There are 32 major languages spoken. Uh, we are worshiping this morning in eight of those languages. There are, um, there are 105 different languages spoken in the Chicago school system today. The world is moving to greater Chicago. We, we currently have, and then uh, the fascinating thing is that uh, 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 English, 5.7 million, Spanish, 1.4 million. There are 1.5 million people that live in the Chicago area that do not self-identify with either speaking Spanish or speaking English. They speak one of those other languages. The world is moving to Chicago. Um, we have 75 missions. Uh, we have once or twice a year, we have all of our, all of our um, churches get together. I hope you'll put on your calendar you don't have any plans for April the 10th, 2016, we'll have between 1,500, 1,800 Nazarenes that will come to Centennial Chapel and we will have our annual celebration. We hope that you'll put that into your schedule. Um, in this mission area right here, there are 3,524,000 people who live in this northwest quadrant and your church is smack dab right in that center. There are 40% that don't have any connection with any church. That means 1,411,000 people do not know Jesus plus. That's our mission field. So thank you for being a church that's always thinking about the next person that needs to come. Um, we, uh, we have these priorities that we talk about. If you hang around the district uh, for any length of time, you'll hear us talk about foundations and multiplication, growing leaders, the importance of renewal, and everybody serving and giving. But today I want to talk about how do we cultivate a thankful spiritual heart. Um, I don't know what your spiritual background is. This may be your first or second or third Sunday. I have not had the privilege of meeting many of you, so I don't know what you think about God. But I've got great news for you. I know what he thinks about you. So would you read this with me out loud? Let's read this out loud together. Paul says, when you come together, give yourself to the public reading of Scripture. So let's read these, this passage out loud from Isaiah and Jeremiah. Read it with me. You are precious and honored in my sight, and I love you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have engraved your name on the palm of my hands. Did you know that God, if you're a believer, God has your name in his hand where he can look at it every day? All, all that tells me, Kaylee, is that God's got big hands. Amen. You all know the African-American spiritual. He's got the, the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. Why is this church blessed? The scripture actually tells us that the 
that any time God blesses or anoints a congregation, it's because this happens. Would you read this with me out loud? This is actually from David in the Old Testament, but he's describing why the anointing of God ever comes on God's people. Read it with me. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. It's like the oil flowing over Aaron's beard. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. Do you know the most important gift you can give to this congregation is for you to get on your knees and on your face before God and make sure that you maintain the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. It's the only way, because in that kind of environment, the Bible says there the Lord bestows his blessing. That's where the Lord bestows his blessing. Life evermore. And, um, and that's why this church is blessed. Now, I believe that it's possible for churches to enjoy a spirit-anointed, uh, spirit-baptized uh, attitude that permeates a church. And that happens because people hear, people see, people think differently. And that leads us to our text for today. If you have, in fact, it's, it's on just four or five verses from where we started, from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. Let's begin reading with verse 9. The scripture, the scripture tells us this, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those that love him. I thought this referred to heaven until I, until I started really studying the text. You know, what my eyes can't see, what my ears can't hear, what my mind ha- can't conceive. Uh, her, uh, Pastor Herba, I, I thought this always referred to heaven until I started studying the text. Now, this may be a veiled reference to heaven, but this isn't talking about heaven. It's talking about now. What my eyes don't physically see, what my ears don't physically hear, what my mind doesn't physically think in this natural realm, the Bible says God wants to and has revealed it to us by his spirit in another realm. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those that love him, but God has revealed it to us by the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul goes on and says this, the Spirit searches all things. And we're not talking today about the, about the surface things of God. Paul calls these the deep things of God. He says the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And then he makes the statement. He says, for who knows a person's thoughts except that person's spirit within them? Now, um, can you, is, is it okay for me to kind of walk just for that one, one for a little bit? This is what the, uh, Paul is saying in this passage right now. And I, 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 I know Brother Herb, so can I use you as an example today? Okay. Now, uh, you all know Pastor Herb? Everybody who thinks Pastor Herb's a fabulous man, say amen. amen. These people really like you, Herb, okay? <laughs> now, here's what Paul is saying here. No one knows what Pastor Herb is thinking right now except his what? Talk to me. His spirit. His spirit within him. Oh, he's, his spirit is the only thing that knows what he's thinking right now. Okay? Everybody tracking? Okay, and your first name is Linda. You all know who Linda is? Okay, everybody who thinks Linda's a fabulous human being, say amen. amen. I just met uh, Linda the second time. She's actually on the board, I might have heard. So uh, you folk actually trust her. <laughs> so here's what the Paul is saying. Not only does no one knows the thoughts of Pastor Herb except Herb's, Herb's spirit, nobody knows Linda's thoughts except Linda's. Okay, so Linda is the only one that knows Linda's thoughts. Pastor Herb is the only one who knows Pastor Herb's thoughts. Paul is saying no one knows your thoughts except your Okay, Paul says no one knows the thoughts of a person except that person's spirit. Now, this gets really good. Look what the scripture goes on to say. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the... In other words, who knows what God Almighty is thinking right now? The Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit knows what God is thinking. And then Paul really starts to go deep. And he says, if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, if, if a person doesn't have the Spirit of God, they, they don't belong to God. So if you are a Christian and you have opened up your heart to God, you have received the Holy Spirit. And not only have you received the Holy Spirit, it is your spirit that knows what you are thinking. And not only that, when you open up your heart to receive the Holy Spirit and your spirit knows what you are thinking, it is the Holy Spirit of God that knows what God is thinking. And if your spirit is open to the Holy Spirit, Paul goes on to say, we have not received the spirit of the world, or at least we shouldn't have. Now, we do have, uh, this is, uh, I think, church number 61 for Denise and I. So we, we have been busy every Sunday, preaching in a different church. We have 75, so um, uh, Andrew, we, we, have a, we have a few more yet to go. But the amazing thing is, um, there are some places where we go, and I know the spirit of Jesus is guiding and directing large numbers of people in the church. Um, I've also been in some places where I'm, I wondered if it was the spirit of Jesus or if it was the spirit of the world that was guiding people's thinking. But the great promise is this. We have not received the spirit of the world, or Paul says at least we shouldn't, but we have received the spirit who is from God, and if your spirit is open to the Holy Spirit, and your spirit knows what you are thinking, the case that Paul is making is we have received God's spirit so that we, you, we, so that you and I can know and understand what God wants to freely give us. He wants to freely give us this. And then Paul goes on and says this, this is what we speak in words taught by the Spirit. Now, the words I believe that are taught by the Spirit are not the words that I'm going to use today. The words that are taught by the Spirit are the ones that I may choose to use, but the Holy Spirit applies to your heart that allow the Holy Spirit in your spirit to help you take another step. If I have one desire in prayer for our congregations is that we will pray and we will plan and we will expect divine moments to happen every single day and every single week in the ministry of our churches. Divine moments can happen in your life whenever God talks to you because you have a spirit and you have opened your spirit to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit and tells you you're supposed to do something and you choose to do it. And those spiritual steps never stop in our spiritual journey. The only way that our spiritual growth stops is when we stop obeying what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Now can you just dream with me what would happen if every single person in the Naperville Trinity Church, every single member we have would so open their spirit to the Holy Spirit that when the Holy Spirit whispers whatever it is, that they would automatically take the next step. They would just take the next step. And here's, the, here's, here's what the Scripture teaches. He's more anxious to whisper to your spirit than you are to listen. Now, the person without the Spirit, like if we were to go out, if, if Pastor Herb and Linda and I were to go out to the Naperville, is there a mall here in Naperville somewhere? Okay. There's, there's probably several of them. <laughs> so we go out to the mall, and, uh, you know, this afternoon we're shaking hands, and, and by the way, uh, you know, we stick our hand and somebody say, hey, by the way, we're from the Naperville uh, Trinity Church, the Nazarene. Um, did you know that we believe that it's possible for the Holy Spirit to enter our spirit, and, it's po and we believe that it's possible for us to listen to the Holy Spirit so we can actually know what God is thinking because the Spirit knows what God is thinking. The Spirit has been put into our spirit so we can connect with the thinking of God. We actually believe that in our church. You know what they're going to look at you and say? 
you are nuts. Why? Because the scripture says the person that doesn't and doesn't live connect with the Holy Spirit doesn't accept these things that come from the Spirit of God. Why? Because they think they are foolish. Why? Because this requires spiritual discernment. Only through the Holy Spirit can you understand this deep things. But quite frankly, this is the heart of our doctrine in the Church of the Nazarene. We actually believe that the, that the Spirit of an individual can be baptized and immersed with the Holy Spirit. We call that entire sanctification. Quite frankly, that doesn't just make you perfect in, in your behavior because we, we have all kinds of people that really love Jesus with all their heart, but they're really imperfect. Anybody met one of those? Okay. So here's how I define sanctification. Sanctification doesn't make you just perfect. It makes you perfectly capable of admitting that you're not. What it does is it drops the defense mechanism. So you're no longer trying to explain your imperfect behavior or hide behind walls, but you just open up your heart to God and you say, God, whatever step you want me to take, I am entirely devoted to you, and here is Jesus, and here is Larry, and there is a gap, and so I'm not going to try to explain away the need for me to regularly repent of the gap. And I'm never going to fold my hands and say, well, bless God, I'm not nearly as bad as the other person over there. But what I do is I always keep a spirit of repentance, a spirit of brokenness, a broken and a contrite heart the Bible says he'll never despise. So I live sanctified moment by moment as I open up my spirit to the Holy Spirit, listening to what the Spirit tells me that he wants me to do. And this, Paul says, can only be discerned by the Holy Spirit. So real quickly, let me just simply, let me simply give you the three characteristics of the people who have developed this incredibly thankful. I'm so grateful for the words at our prayer time this morning because, you know, one of the, the, the most important emotional attitude you can ever develop is gratitude. Do you know why Paul writes that in Philippians? Do you know that it's impossible for you to be filled with incredible gratitude and also be filled with incredible worry at the same time? If you are incredibly grateful, you'll find that, that, the, that, the, that the emotions of worry will start to drain out because the gratitude will displace it. Did you know that if you have anger, you, you, you name the frustration that tends to dominate your emotions. If you will replace that with gratitude, you know what? All of that stuff will start being swept out of your life. And just like uh, Pastor Steve said, you know, with thanksgiving, if you present your requests, his peace will guard your heart and your life. So people who develop this kind of a thankful heart, this kind of a spiritual heart, they have three characteristics. Number one, they see with spiritual eyes. They hear with spiritual ears. And they think with a spiritual mind. Real quickly, Paul writes, he, he, he actually prays this prayer in Ephesians 1. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. Anybody ever sung the uh, song, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. It actually comes from this passage. Open the eyes of my heart. People who see with spiritual, uh, the, who have a thankful spiritual heart, they see with spiritual eyes. Secondly, they hear with spiritual ears. They hear with more than natural ears. I wish I could tell you. Anybody ever had the experience? Uh, I've had this on numerous occasions where the Holy Spirit, He's just impressed. And you, there's no way that you can quantify it. He's just telling you, you've got to pick up the phone. You have got to send a text. You've got to do something now. And you do it. And on the other end of the line, somebody said, how in the world did you know? Why? The Holy Spirit is speaking to our spirit. And he is, he's, he's sensitizing our ears. We live in this realm. They hear with spiritual ears. You know the, uh, and you know the passage with uh, Samuel. The Bible says that Samuel, young Samuel, he didn't yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord hadn't been revealed to him, and he had grown up in church. So he ran to Eli three times 
And finally, the scripture says that Eli said, no, no, no. You need to go back and lie down. And when he calls you again, would you read these words with me out loud? Let's read these out loud together. Speak, for your servant is listening. Do you know that if you will listen with spiritual ears and you will sensitize yourself, the God that created everything will, learn, will talk to your spirit and you'll learn to listen to his voice. You can listen to what God is saying. Do you know at the end, many of, many of Jesus' parables, how does he close it? And everybody he's talking to has, has physical ears. What does he say over and over again in the Gospels? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is talking about spiritual ears beyond the physical ears. So they see with spiritual eyes. They hear with spiritual ears. Lastly, they think with a spiritual mind. You know, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, don't be conformed to the world. And it's so easy because it's so easy for us. The reason why we need worship every single week is because this is the time that we are reminded that we need to renew our minds to not think like everything that surrounds us all week long. We are reminded that we have to have a transformed mind. Our mind has to be transformed. And then if we will be faithful and not allow the world to, to consume us and will not allow the world to squeeze us into its mold, we can test and we can approve what God's will is for our individual lives and for the life of the church. And it's described in three words. Listen to this. Would you read these with me out loud? What, how, how is God's will described? It is good. It is pleasing. It is perfect. You can't get any better than this. You know, there, always, there, there used to be an old beer commercial. I just detest him. And the, re, the reason I detest him is that some of them are so funny and they're so good, you know. You know and they have us laughing and I'm thinking to myself, I know, but that's so untrue. They, they, they used to have a Budweiser commercial that, that actually, you know, these guys are sitting around a lake, sitting around a campfire. They've just eaten fresh fish, just, you know, eating out of the lake, and they're, they're, they're sitting there drinking beer. And somebody says, you know, it doesn't get any better than this. Anybody remember that? And I think to myself, oh, I, every time I saw that, I, I, I want you to stand up and scream and say, yes, it does get so much better than that. This is you can't get anything better than this. You can't get anything better. Good, pleasing, and perfect? The will of God. And when you are in that sweet spot and you know it, and the smile of heaven is on your life, oh, man. You know God's just talked to you. You know that you've just taken that step. You know that the Spirit has just spoken to your spirit and told you to do something. And then all of a sudden, you have that euphoria feeling that you have just pleased the almighty creator of the universe. He knows you by name, and he is pleased with you. It doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't get any better than that. It's a good will. It's a pleasing will. It's a perfect will. And Paul says this is what we speak in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. And then, you know, the, the, the closing part of this passage, the promise that he gives. Would you, would you read this with me out loud? Let's read this out loud together. We have the mind of Christ. Did you know it's not that we can have the mind of Christ? It's not that we should have the mind of Christ. If you see with spiritual eyes, if you hear with spiritual ears, if you think with a spiritual mind, if your spirit is open to the Holy Spirit, you have the mind of Christ. You know what he wants you to do. You think with his mind. You hear with his ears. And it doesn't get any better than that. We have the mind of Christ. So this is the result. We start to think like, well, what, what, does, what does Jesus think? What does Jesus cry over? What does Jesus get happy about? What does Jesus have a heart for? How, I, I, how can I be guided by his will, by his values, by his spirit? How can my agenda become his agenda? And we know why, because the spirit 
is telling our spirit what we should do. And just as a reminder, the Holy Spirit can do more in about five minutes when that happens than we can do in five years on our own. Five minutes. Five minutes. So this is, this is the promise. We can cultivate a spiritual, thankful heart because we see with spiritual eyes. We hear with spiritual ears. And we think with a spiritual mind. Let's pray. Father, I'm just so grateful for this great church. Pastors Steve and Sister Kaylee for their spiritual leadership. I want to thank you for this great staff. I want to thank you for this great board. And I want to thank you that in this place we honor the Holy Spirit. We listen to the Holy Spirit. We, we defer the Holy Spirit. We are, we are not just casual Christians, but we are Christians that actually believe that our spirits can be baptized with the Holy, immersed with the Holy Spirit. This has been our cardinal doctrine that we are called to Christianize Christianity. It is not just enough to be saved from, from uh, our sins, but we actually want to go into the deep things of God so that our minds are renewed. So, Father, in this moment, as you are having conversations at the close of this service with every single person in this room or that's listening by way of tape or internet, I pray today that you would help each of them to take the next step they need to take. Lord, it could be that while I have been speaking today that, there, that you have brought to mind an individual that someone has a relationship with that it's fractured. They've either said something or they've done something that has caused a break in the relationship. And your scripture says that if we have any walls between ourselves and somebody else, we're supposed to go and tear those down. And so I pray that in this moment that you would help them to obey and decide that they will obey the voice of the Spirit for that issue. Lord, there are people that are here today that maybe this is just their third or fourth or fifth time and they have spent the last two or three years church shopping from one place to another. Would you move on their hearts today and remind them that they ultimately, there are 30 commands in the New Testament that they cannot, cannot obey if they're not a part and a committed part of a local church fellowship. So I pray that you would help them to settle down. Help them to choose this church as their church home and help them to get in and decide that they will grow. I pray, Father, for those people that are here today, but they have never made a, a radical commitment to this church. They come on Sunday morning and they, they kind of sit and they enjoy this fellowship and they're a Christian, they enjoy this present, but they've never gone into the deep things of God for true obedience. And I pray that in this moment that they would take the next step and they would decide that they're going to join this church. I pray for those people that maybe they have just been tipping, but they have never decided that they will be honor you with their first fruits and tithe. I pray that today would be the day that they would make that decision and they would go deep with you. I pray, Father, for those individuals who, who have never become self-feeding Christians. They, 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 they don't either listen to your word or take your word in except on Sunday. And so today you are challenging them to become a self-feeding Christian. That is the next step for them. That they will become growing individuals that will feed on your word and learn that people are not to live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from your mouth. And they pray every day, give us this day our daily bread. I pray, Father, for those individuals who they live in their world and they don't see the whole world. Thank you for the Church of the Nazarene's ministry, not only on our district where we're planting churches and growing the church, but, but I want to thank you for the global mission of the church. Thank you for the 30,000 congregations that we have, many of them in harm's way, for the 50 people that have given their lives, that are pastors and key lay leaders that have been beheaded or killed on the front lines of the, of the Muslim-Christian conflict. For all of those people in Africa and India that have given their lives for your church and they are on the front lines and they are spreading the kingdom in spite of the risks. I pray that you'd help us never to be casual Christians but help us to be the kind of people that will be worthy of the name Christian. 
And I pray for the global church today. I pray that you would help this church to continue its great legacy of not just thinking about themselves or their own family, but actually seeing the world the way you see it. For them being the global congregation that they are, we want to say thank you. And so, Father, I just pray that this church would have a blessed anointing. Lord, we, we, we read your word where it says how good and blessed it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. It's like the oil. There the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. We pray that spiritual life, spiritual vitality, and even the transformation of people's spirits would continue here. Because life evermore would happen because of the unity of the spirit that this church enjoys. Thank you, Father. For your anointing that we know rests here. And for your word today, we receive it. And we pray that you'll teach us what we're supposed to do with it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we offer all of our praise. Amen. Amen. Can we show our appreciation to Dr. McCain? Thank you. We're at the end of the service, and, uh, and uh, Dr. McCain, Denise, and Andrew, we have a um, tradition that we do where we do a benediction as a congregation together, and I'd invite you now as a congregation to stand, and in the standing, um, and I'd also invite you if you would like to follow both Pastor Tony and I um, out, we, uh, we like to get out there and, and uh, shake hands with people. In fact, if you're visiting with us, and I haven't had a chance to shake your hand over the last couple of weeks, please come find me, and uh, I'd like to connect with you and uh, know your name and, and just kind of get to know you a little bit better. But uh, so if you wouldn't mind holding out your hands and receiving this blessing for us this morning. And Trinity, if this is a familiar words to you, would you say these with me? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you are sent.